Hello guys, welcome to uh, part five of my life working on cruise ships in the early years. Thank you again for all of your nice comments and uh, I've tried to answer as many as I could. Uh, as I told you before, um, you know, lots of great things happened on ships. I had some wonderful times, but there were also some, uh, some sad times too, some uh, dark experiences, bad experiences, things that I witnessed, things that I saw. Um, and some of you asked me to, to mention those as well, so I'm going to tell you about one of them that really stuck with me. It was on a carnival ship. I don't remember the year. I'm sorry. I can't even remember which ship it was, but we were sailing out of Long Beach. And I want to preface this story by telling you that in no way, shape, or form was this carnival's fault. There's nothing the cruise line could have done to prevent this. They didn't have anything to do with it. It just happened to take place on one of their ships. And here's what happened. We were sailing out of Long Beach. There was a large family on board and uh, they were having a family reunion. So there was probably 20 of them. You know, mother, fathers, grandfathers, you know, brothers, sisters, all ages from 70 down to like three years old. What happened was they booked a snorkeling trip in Cabo San Lucas, all on their own, not through the cruise line. They went online or however they did. I'm not sure exactly how they booked it, but the cruise line didn't even know they were doing this. And which is fine, a lot of people do that. It's definitely cheaper to book a tour, you know, yourself, you know, on land or through the internet than it is to book it through the cruise line. The only problem with doing that is you're not protected by the ship. For example, if you go on a tour that you book yourself and your tour comes back an hour late, you miss the ship for a sail without you, sorry. If you were on a tour that was booked through the ship, you could be four hours late, that ship's not leaving until you get back. And that ship's gonna be, that cruise line's gonna be responsible for you no matter what happens, if you get injured, they're going to make sure you get to a hospital. They're going to bring you back to the ship and take care of you. You're going to be looked after. So you're paying more money, but you're getting extra protection. This family did not do that. The tour they went on was on a, almost like this marine landing craft. Have you ever seen the old films of World War II when they're storming the beaches of Normandy? They've got these marine landing craft that they come up right up to the beach and then a little gate drops down and the soldiers and everything come ashore on the beach. This is kind of similar to that. This particular boat, which held about, I don't know, 50, 60 people, was designed to just run right up on the beach like that. And then a little thing came down and people went off from the bow of the ship and went on their tour and went snorkeling on a different boat. What happened was the pilot of the boat instead of coming in straight like he was supposed to, for whatever reason, I don't know, he decided to go in sideways like this, parallel to the beach. And there were waves that day, but you know, not much bigger than normal. But anyway, a wave hit the starboard side of the boat and flipped the whole thing over on top of the people that were inside. And most of this family it was, they were all on there. Most of them drowned. Uh, I remember there was a mother and a little girl that survived. And there was two or three other, the older members of the family who didn't go on the tour, like grandparents and stuff. And that was it, the rest of them got killed. I can't remember the exact number, but I know it was over 12. It was over 12 people. So, um, they get the bodies back on the ship and the captain makes an announcement and everybody was just really, really sad. Um, when we got back to, to uh, Long Beach, I remember the CNN helicopters being there and the vans being there and the news media all being there, filming the ship as it comes in. And of course it was reported, you know, Carnival Cruise Line passengers killed in tragic accident. And they made it sound like the cruise line was, was responsible for this, and they weren't. It's just like, what if the same family had flown in on Delta 
and got in a taxi and went over and took on the same cruise or the same tour and their boat flipped over on top of them and they were killed, would you say Delta was responsible because Delta took them to Mexico? No. And this has happened many times when someone's on a cruise and they go off and do their own thing and something happens to them and they make it sound like it's the cruise line's fault. And these cruise lines aren't perfect. There's, there's been some things that have happened, you know, that are their fault, but this was not their fault in any way at all. So that's, that's my sad story. And I'll tell you one more. Um, when I was assistant cruise director and I was on the Celebrity Horizon, I believe, and first day of the cruise, you have to stand with the captain, hotel director, staff captain, chief engineer at the main entrance to the main show lounge and all the guests come in and the captain greets them, takes pictures with some of them and uh, have champagne and the captain makes a little speech and a little cocktail party, you know, for sometimes for a thousand people. But, you know, we do it at every turnaround day, every, every first day of the cruise, you know, it's that first night. Um, and sometimes it's the first formal night. It's like, like the very first day of the cruise, it'll be like the, the first sea day evening. It's usually the first uh, formal night. So anyway, we're all there. And back then we didn't have pagers. I, or now they've got the, like, just like mobile phones, cell phones. We have them call them handy phones. All the senior staff and all the ships have those. And you can literally call anybody on the ship or you can even call home if you've got the code. And uh, they work perfectly anywhere on the ship. But we didn't have those back then. We just had a radio. And so I had my, I always had to keep my radio with me as did the cruise director. And I get a call. And normally the cruise director would have handled this, but since I was assistant cruise director and the cruise director is busy with a cocktail party, they sent me. And it was an urgent thing about a, a cabin. Something happened in a cabin with a guest and uh, someone had died. And so I go to the cabin Security's there, doctors there, nurses there. There's this woman, very attractive woman, and she's hysterical, absolutely hysterical. She won't talk to anybody, she won't help us, she won't give us any information. And in the bed is her husband who's dead. He had a heart attack and died. And um, we're trying to just like, you know, she needs to sign some papers, we need to get the body out of there and take it down the morgue, arrange to get it off the ship, notify the family back home, et cetera, et cetera, all these things, all this protocol needs to happen when somebody passes away. And this woman has been totally, totally unhelpful in any way. She's just inconsolable. So I shuffle everybody out of the room and I said, look, this, let me spend some time with her and see if I can calm her down. So I sit down with her and she's sobbing and talking, I'm talking her down and, you know, I'm sorry this happened. He, they've taken the body away. And um, I said, so tell me what's really, what's really upsetting? What's, what's the real problem here? Because you won't help us in any way. And you know, I'm, I'm sure you're distraught about you losing your husband and um, you know, how long were you married? And she, she stops on, she goes, we, we weren't, we're not married. And I said, well, you know, that's okay. You know, if you're together and you're a couple, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And she said, no, I, I work for him. He's my boss. So, the truth comes out. They had, she was his personal assistant at their job. I don't remember what the company was or anything like that. It's irrelevant. And uh, they had snuck away together. You know, she had told her husband one story. He told his family another story. Both of them were married in real life. And um, they're on the ship taking the secret cruise for seven days. And I said, okay, you know, don't worry, we can handle it, you know, it's not your responsibility, you haven't done anything wrong, no criminal, no crime has been, been committed here, we'll take care of everything, I just need to know who to contact. And we were able to get her son, his son's phone number somehow, I don't remember how we got it, but we got it. And so we called his son up and said, you know, I'm sorry, but I have to inform you that your, your father passed away on the celebrity Horizon, and he goes, no, 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 they, they can't be. My father is on a business trip, you know, wherever, in Washington or wherever. I said, well, you know, I'm afraid your father's on a cruise ship and he passed away. 
And so that was a mess. <laughs> and, um, you know, we sorted the whole thing out, got her off the ship, got the body off the ship. And there is a morgue on every ship, by the way. And on these big mega ships they have today, and even on, like, I'd say almost every Holland America ship, because they're so old, the Kess are 65 and up. Almost every single cruise that I've been on recently on these mega ships, somebody dies. It's just in the math. There's so many people and they're, they're very old. Some people go on ships for their, um, you know, it's on their bucket list to go on a cruise. And you see them that can barely even get around. And it just happens. Okay, so enough of the sad stories. I told you I would tell you about Disney. I'm trying to remember when this was. Um, it had to be in the early, late 80s, I'd say late 80s. But I don't, I can't swear to that. It was on the SS Norway. But Disney chartered the SS Norway, which sailed out of Miami for two cruises, so 14 days. And they wanted to beta test the whole concept of having a Disney cruise line. And um, so the way it was going to work, there'd be no regular passengers on board. The only people on the ship, and both cruises were sold out full, were people who were associated with Disney. Their families, friends, whatever. But everybody that was going to be on both cruises were somehow involved with Disney. I can't tell you how, but they were all, you know, from the top-notch people all the way down to, you know, I guess regular salespeople or people that worked at the theme parks, whatever, and their families. But... The cruise is full, you know, families, children, everything. So it's like a regular cruise. You'd never know if you, if you saw the people. So anyway, we arrive in Miami early in the morning, like 5 a.m. or something like that. And what we had to do was there was myself. Um, I was an assistant stage manager then. No, no, sorry. I was stage manager on that ship. I was stage manager, two assistants, a couple of technicians, and then they gave us some people from um, housekeeping to help us just basically manhandle move stuff. And what we had to do was after the final show on, let's say it was Friday night, we had to strike, what it means take down all of the equipment in the main show lounge. This show lounge on the Norway held like, you know, over a thousand people, maybe even 2,000, I don't remember exactly. This ship, as I told you before, was the SS France <clears throat> back in 1960. But she was an older ship. So we take down all the lights, or most of the lights, not all the lights, but most of the lights, the lighting board, the sound board, even the spotlights. And then the show we were doing was My Fair Lady. It was like the, the same as a Broadway show, or the off-Broadway show. You know, as a matter of fact, one of the actors was a, an actor who, who performed off-Broadway in it <clears throat> and did the touring production of it. And this is a major show with costumes and props and sets and all kinds of stuff. I mean, you can't imagine how much stuff there is for a show. You know, bits and pieces. So all that stuff <clears throat> has to be taken down, packed up by us, and then offloaded and stored in the port there in Miami. And then the Disney stuff has to be loaded onto the ship. There were six semi-trucks full of stuff. Six. And the show we were doing was making memories. Um, and so we started unloading this stuff early in the morning. So we did the stuff the night before. We didn't get any sleep at all. We worked all night long. And we did not get paid one dime extra for doing this, by the way. We uh, finished getting all the stuff out of the theater, striking everything. And then we start loading the stuff from Disney. And, of course, we had people helping us get the stuff into the show lounge, just moving it, but we were the ones going to be installing it. They sent, they had sent, I believe it was four, yeah, four Disney techs. This is a, the landlord's Doberman Pinscher. Um, four Disney techs to help us. And uh, these guys were... Uh, really not going to do any of the heavy lifting. They were just kind of like, you know, plug and play guys putting stuff together. And uh, it took us all 
it took us almost two days to put everything in, install it all, test it all. Then we had to do rehearsals for the show, Making Memories. And the cast for Making Memories, many of them were, um, were little people, you know, dwarfs or whatever you want to call, you know, people like the guy in Game of Thrones, small people. I know what the politically correct term is for these people nowadays, but there was probably six of them, for whatever reason, were, were small. Um, and you see these guys in the crew bar. Um, when we weren't working, we actually got to go to the crew bar and take a break. And you see them and say, so hi, what character are you? I can't tell you, a secret. Mickey's real, Minnie's real. You know, they, they wouldn't tell us who they were, what characters they were. It's like a secret. So, um, anyway, we finally finished rehearsals and we're ready for the show, which is going to be on like the first formal night. And these guys that were helping us from Disney were, were assholes, basically. They were all doing cocaine, all of them. Back then, you know, there, those things were going on the ships. It wasn't that unusual, but I mean, it was... Um, they were just useless, really. We did all the work. And they were just kind of, you know, this one goes here, that goes there, plug this in here, whatever. But since I was a stage manager, I was still going to be the guy calling the cues, which means I've got a headset on. My headset is connected to two spotlights, to stage left, stage right, and also to somebody backstage. And um, so we're doing the show. And we're all, my team, we're all kind of pissed off because we're tired. We found out we weren't going to get paid a penny extra for all this extra work. And we still, we still got to put all our show back together when this is over in two weeks. We, we got that in the back of our heads. So uh, the show starts and it was a little rocky that night. Not too bad, but a little bit rocky. And making memories, of, there's a two spiral stair or sweeping staircases that come down like Gone with the Wind. One from the stage left, stage right, to come down like that. And during the first big scene, Minnie and Mickey, like spotlight comes on, there's Minnie, there's Mickey, music's playing, and they're coming down the stairway. Well, Mickey, whoever Mickey was, we don't know, actually it was revealed, got seasick. He wasn't feeling too well. He's got this big, you know, Mickey Mouse head on. And as they're coming down, like they're doing the little uh, dance routine, you're matching each other, and he's getting out of step. You can tell, like, he doesn't, he's not doing too well. Like, she's doing this and he's doing that. And they get, like, halfway down the stairs, and the head that's a Mickey head falls off. And we see that he's thrown up inside of his head. That's why the head fell off. And the head is bouncing down the staircases in time to the music, which was quite cool. Since I'm calling the cues, I said, spot one, stay on the head, stay on the head. And so spot one stayed on the head and watched it as it bounced down the stairs into the orchestra pit. <laughs> so anyway, but yeah, it just was like, a lot of work, those crews, that cruise, a lot of, you know, two cruises, a lot of work. They brought all these films on board for us to show the, the standard, um, you know, Disney films, all the classics, Snow White and stuff. And they had them playing all day long in the theater. Even nobody wanted to watch them, they were showing these films. And of course, the tech staff, we have to show the films. So we're all taking turns, you know, going in the projection booth, just like I talked to you on Royal Viking, but these were 16 millimeter, the great big spools like this. And if I remember right, yeah, these were, they had done it different at Disney. Like at, uh, on Royal Viking, it was three spools average per movie. So you'd show one, then two, then three, two different projectors. With Disney, there were just big giant spools. Like, you know, Little Mermaid was one great big spool. Well, anyway, the guys figured out that, you know, you could figure out how long the movie was because it was on the box. Let's say the movie's 90 minutes. And they just put on the movie and they'd go two decks up to the pool deck and lay out in the sun, go for a swim, have a drink, whatever. And then come down when the movie's over, turn the lights off, rewind the film and go back to their cabin. Because we weren't getting paid any extra anyway, remember that. Anyway, one of the guys did that 
and um, and we all knew we were all doing it. I was doing it too. And he comes back to the projection room, and there's this big pile of smoke and film, like that tall, on the ground, and it come off the track inside the projector. Like I've told you before about all the little gates and stuff with these projectors, and this hot arc lamp, quartz lamp, had burned a hole in like every other frame. <laughs> It's a, there's a big pile. It's still smoldering, you know? And these films are expensive. They're worth thousands of dollars. And so Disney was kind of pissed about that. So, anyway, the end of the cruise, um, they had this big ceremony. And they wanted to thank everybody. You know, they're so nice. And they offered us jobs, by the way, at Disney, which I turned down. Um, as stage manager, you know, work in one of the theme parks or something, which I had no interest in that at all. But anyway, they had the ceremony, and so some guy from Disney, you know, it wasn't Eisner, it was somebody else was president back then, brings the cruise director up there and the captain, and they give the captain this Disney jacket, you know, leather jacket with Mickey Mouse on the back, which I'm sure he never wore. <laughs> and the cruise director, they gave him a Mickey Mouse watch, yay! You know, worth like, what, 20 bucks? And then they bring the whole tech staff up and give us a big round of applause. Thank you so much, guys, all your extra work. We know you work day and night to do this for us. And they gave us each a pair of Mickey Mouse ears. I swear to God. Here's your Mickey Mouse ears. <laughs> no money, no cocaine, <laughs> Mickey Mouse ears. So, you know, I don't like Disney to this day. I hate taking my daughters there. So um, that's my, my story for... Uh, for Disney, and uh, I've got some other stuff coming up. For if you want to see another one, let me know. I've got endless stories about cruise ships. Um, the Norway, by the way, I'm trying to think when this happened. It was in the early 1990s. I was still working on ships. I was on a board when this happened, but she was tied up in Miami right after the guests had gotten off the ship, and there was a fire. Yeah, if I remember right, um, eight crew members were killed in that fire. And that was the NVS of Norway. That was the that ship was done. Um, and she should have been retired a long time before that. It was made in the 1960s. Like I said, it was designed for the different classes, like steerage class and first class and whatever middle class was. And that ship was amazed to get around. So if you were in one part of the ship trying to get to another one, it wasn't very easy. There was no... I-95, like it's usually a crew corridor in those ships where those ships nowadays go from, you know, the, the bow to the stern of the ship and like a highway, you could just take, walk all the way down and take an elevator up wherever you want to go. Not so on this ship. And uh, so there's a fire and that ship was gone. That was the end of the end of the SS Norway. So that's, uh, that's it guys. Uh, that's kind. Come up with another one tomorrow. If you're interested, let me know if you're interested. Any comments you've got, questions you've got. Like I said, a lot of these things I'm telling you happened over 30 years ago, 38 years ago. So the old memory is not what it used to be. Um, so I'll try and answer your questions. Thanks for watching. And I'm going to be doing a live stream sometime. Maybe tomorrow I'll try it. Um, and see how that goes. I've never done it before. But I don't want to really sit here and talk to myself, even though I'm getting used to it. So anyway, thanks a lot, guys. Have a good day. Bye.